Hi everyone, we are back again. Um, this is a recap, redo of a series of Facebook Live videos that we had some internet signal being wonky. So if things feel repetitive or off kilter, that's why. Um, to reintroduce, I am Libby Cripps. I am known in the SCA as Elisif Gita's daughter, and I really love tablet weaving. And this class specifically is how to warp up an ankle style loom, which is various sizes, but to some degree, they all look more or less like this for tablet weaving and do it in a speed warp, also called a continuous warp. The first thing to do before you start that is actually look at your pattern and see whether or not your pattern will work for speed warping. When you're looking at the patterns, if a card started all four colors the same, you're good. Speed warp away. If it has one card that has a separate color, or I'm sorry, one hole that's a separate color in the card, you're good. If it has two different, but they're on diagonal, two colors, you're fine. Green check marks all the way. If it has two colors and they're side by side, two colors still, you're good. You can speed warp that pattern all the way through. This handout and my speed warping guide are both on the website and that will be linked in the comments as well. Here's where it gets funky. If you add a third color and the colors are side by side, red, yellow, you cannot speed warp that. That is because if you try to flip that card from S to Z, they get out of order. There is no way to take this card and rotate it to get the colors in the same order as this card. You have to thread those separately. But if it's three colors in their diagonal, you're good. You can rotate the red and yellow to get them opposite. If it's four colors, unless your pattern is all S threaded or all Z threaded, you're not going to be able to speed work that. If your pattern is a combination of these, you can look and go, okay, cards one through seven are green check marks. I can speed warp all those cards. Card eight, oh, nope, can't speed warp card eight and nine. You can individually warp those two cards, tie them onto your speed warp, and still come out better than trying to individually warp every single card. Um, I've had weavers tell me that warping up takes them hours, and we just did this on a Facebook Live with some technical difficulties and having to restart and questions in about 45 minutes. On average, if I'm just working at home to get it done, I can speed warp a loom in about 20 minutes. So this should not be something that's painful. Once you've looked at your cards and you know you're good, I can speed warp my pattern. The next thing to do is look at the individual cards in your pattern and see how many colors there are of each, I'm sorry, how many threads of each color there are on a single card. So for example here, these cards all have three blue, one yellow. So I would need three separate blue strands and one yellow strand to speed warp these cards. These need four red strands. Count up what you need. If you have differing colors throughout the pattern, and say, for example, this card has two blue, two yellow, but this card has one yellow, three blue, you're not going to be able to speed warp those two together. You're going to have to go and... Okay. This is also recorded the week of coronavirus, so my kids are home from school. Apologies. All right. We are counting. So... If cards one through four have one yellow, cards five and six have two yellow, you cannot speed warp those together. You can speed warp one through four, and then you can speed warp five and six, but you cannot speed warp the cards all together if the number of threads change. So depending upon what pattern I'm working on, I may have to go, okay, I have five cards that I can speed warp together here. I have three cards I can speed warp together here and two cards that are just gonna have to be individually warped. That's okay. You can tie them onto each other. We're actually gonna go through that, doing that with border cards. So we're gonna warp up something very similar to this um, because I just worked up this exact pattern in a Facebook Live. I'm gonna change it just a little bit. We're gonna do two yellow and two blue. 
in this intersection. That's the only difference. Once you've counted, I need four red, two yellow, two blue. You get out your bobbins and your thread. Now on the website, I have listed some of my favorite suppliers. Please feel free to use that, use your own. This I'm working with silk thread today. Um, this is 220 silk from AO and Weaver. I happen to really like working with silk. So you need bobbins and thread equal to the total number of threads you need. These guys are shacked uh, weaving bobbins. They're what you work with on a larger scale weaving loom with boat shuttles, but they work phenomenally for this too, because these little lips on the end keep your threads from sliding off. And I want to say I usually end up paying about a dollar a piece for them. If you don't have these or don't have access to them, you can make a tube of paper and wrap your thread around a tube of paper. Speaking of wrapping, don't do this by hand. This guy is your best friend. This is your average household drill. You know, it was probably a $10 special, $15 special. Battery, rechargeable. A wooden dowel on the end turns into this perfect device that holds a bobbin for speed warping. Add thread, wind, makes your life a whole lot easier. You can wind all of your bobbins very much, much faster that way. Um, wind up all of your bobbins for your project. In this particular one, I needed to end up with four reds. So I have three red bobbins, one red comb, and then I wanted two yellow and two blue. Two yellow bobbins, two blue bobbins, done. We have all of our cards. This is a 12 card pattern. Take your cards, put the bobbins that you're not ready for yet out of the way. Take your container. The first time that I learned how the continuous warp, Mistress Theodore of West Kingdom was teaching me, and we were in a hayfield out at an event. And I had four cones of number 10 cotton crochet thread rolling around a grassy hayfield. It works. It is still much, much faster than individually working. It also sets off my OCD to a ridiculous degree. And it does make it more challenging because the threads will want to twist around each other. If you're doing that at home, your bobbin's just going to take off and it's going to be in the other room somewhere. and Or your dog's going to steal it or your five-year-old's going to have it wrapped around, you know, four tables voice of experience. These guys came from the dollar store. Um, any smooth sided container with a hole, really. This can be an old milk jug. It can be a bucket, a vase, a yarn bowl, random. And they don't have to be the same. I happen to just have a whole bunch of these because I use them around the house. But any kind of container that will let your thread sit smoothly inside that you can thread through the hole so that it's going to stay in there and that you can just sit flat and it's not going to move around. I have four of these. Now I found for me that it works a little better if I keep these close under my feet and they're kind of centered to where I'm working instead of off to the side somewhere. Take your bobbin, bucket, thread through the hole. Repeat for the number of times. Two, three, and four. All right, so I have my four spools of thread down around my feet. Looking at my pattern, I have two border cards that are solid red. Two cards. You're going to take your two cards and line them up together so that the holes line up. So we're not worried about S and Z direction. We're not worried about threading angle. We just need the holes lined up and the correct number of cards. Those are your two things that matter. Take your four threads and run them through your cards, through both cards that are stacked together. Once I get them Threaded, I will show you again. Hmm. 
All right, here we go. So we have, oops, I don't want to lose the threads. Okay, our cards are now threaded. One thread is going through each hole and the threads are running continuously through both cards. I'm trying to hold this where you guys can see easily. Take the ends. Now you want the front ends to be about the same length. Um, I tend to just clip them short and even, personal preference. We're going to switch the camera angle here. So now you're looking at the loom. This is the front peg of my loom. There's a couple different styles of ankle looms. Some of them have this extra front peg. Some of them just have the tension bar. Does not matter. This works the same way with any loom that you can make a circle of the warp. That's really all you're doing here. So you take your ends and you're going to tie them in a single bow, um, any kind of knot, whatever you're comfortable here that you can undo. This is not going to be a permanent knot. I just need it to hold still while I run the rest of the warp around the pattern. So I found single bow, slide it in. If you're like me and you lose your cards, pick them back up. I'm working on a smaller desk than I usually do, so. All right, we are double checking that all four threads are running through the cards correctly. And I believe, there we go. I dropped them, so I had to straighten them back out. So at this point, it's tied onto the front. I have two cards. We're gonna take one card and slide it down. Only one card will slide down. If you try to slide the other one, it's gonna get stuck on top of the first card you'll know which one. You, you will not be able to get them in the wrong order. I'm gonna drop one card there, keeping the other card in my other hand and making sure my threads stay nice and smooth, I'm gonna wind this warp around. Now, my personal preference on tension bars is to have them close to the card side of the warp instead of the finished. So I always warp all the way up to my back peg, back here, back down to the front tension bar. If you are starting at the front tension bar because that's your loom setup, you don't have an issue. Back as long as I want my warp to be and around to the front. So we have now come all the way around. Our loop, we have loops back here. Our other threads are still connected down there at the bottom. We're going back to the same card. We're going to take that second card and drop it. Just we're leaving that second card in place and sliding on around that exact same path with our threads. And you can kind of push them next to each other so you can see that they stay nice and even. We're coming all the way back around to the front. Now I have no more cards on the loom. Both cards are right here. Each one is threaded on to the floor. I'm gonna take my loose ends and snip them. Breathe, it's okay. Looking here, you can see two cards. Each one has its threads running around. Here is our beginning loop. It's kind of underneath, there you go. Right there's our beginning bow. Here's our tail. We're ready to do, in this case now, the body cards. Again, because this is a do-over of a Facebook video, I'm actually doing two blue and two yellow, just so I have two slightly different bands. Um, they'll actually be really neat to put side by side and see the difference that using one yellow thread versus two makes. So we're going to set aside our red. If you have enough buckets, you can just, you know, set the entire bucket aside. I don't have that many buckets. I have learned the hard way that if you try to put multiple bobbins in a bucket, just go, okay, now I'm just going to swap to my blue bobbin. What will inevitably happen is this little tail of the red that's just kind of hanging out right here is going to get really excited about that blue bobbin. And it's going to wrap itself around it in the biggest knot you have ever seen. <laughs> so do not recommend that particular technique. All right. But now, same exact process. 
taking our blue and our yellow. And we are threading them right back through those same bins. Again, they're all under my feet, so they're pretty close to convenient there. Now the center part of my pattern is eight cards. So I'm going to take my cards, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards. And same exact thing, stack them up nice and neat, just like a deck of cards, line up the holes. These are wood cards. They are linked on my website, so you can find these exact same ones if you like. Um, they're about my favorites. They're very, very nice and thin, but they're very sturdy and very smooth to work with. I'm going to take them, and I'm going to take the blue and yellow threads and do the exact same thing. One thread through the hole, all the way through all eight cards. Again, because this pattern is a green check mark pattern, I'm not worried about S and Z. I'm not worried about threading direction. I am only worried that I get one thread through each hole. And because I'm working with two strands, that I have them in the right spots. Because there's two possibilities here. The yellows could go next to each other, or they could go diagonal. If they're diagonal, you end up with narrower narrow repeating lines right next to each other. If they are side by side in your pattern, you will end up with thicker lines that are gonna be a little stronger. I actually want mine to be stronger. So I'm putting my two yellows side by side. So my pattern will appear denser and thicker instead of really narrow and fine stripes. Uh, if that is something you guys have questions about, please let me know and we can do a patterning video. I'd be happy to do that. So we're taking our fourth blue and now we have eight cards that have two blue strands, two yellow strands, one strand in each hole, and it's running through all eight. Take those ends, tie them, take the cut end of your red, so this is the bottom, after it's gone through and come all the way back around to the top, and aiming to end up with a knot right about here on this front peg. Now, I have found for me that take, making knots in silk works really best when I lay them side by side, make a square knot, and then just pass the tail through again. It's just a really simple knot, but instead of tying them to each other, I'm tying them together, and that seems to work out best. Now, I have left my red too long, my knot's all the way up here at the top. I don't want it up here, I want it down here, no big deal. We are just going to trim that off and move it down. Now, you can work with them far apart, your knots don't have to line up exactly. Just be aware that the distance between your highest knot and your lowest knot, you will lose. So depending upon if you have measured out exactly enough silk or fiber to weave with, if you if your knots are off, you're going to actually lose some distance. So here we go. Trim that a little bit shorter, and now we're lining up to where our knot is right here. We're going to take those eight blue and yellow cards, straighten out the threads a little bit, peel off one. Again, only one is going to slide. This card will not slide down. It's stuck on this side of your hand going down to the cones. Slide one and slide it next to those yellows. We're not worried about S and Z. We're not worried about where the yellow is at or where the blue is at. We're just putting it in place. Then measure out the work. Come back around to the top. Drop a card. You want to repeat this for every card. You want to keep going around and dropping one card each time. If you have the distraction factor in the form of a small child or life or, you know, a brain squirrely husband, whatever, and you happen to go around and forgot to drop a card. Whoops. There's a couple things you can do. You can simply ignore that thread. You can cut that thread out completely and retie the one before and after it to each other. Um, 
you can use it and make it a design feature and play with it in and out of your work. You've got a couple different choices there. If you accidentally leave two and your pattern is going to be off, what I do, depending upon how far you get before you notice, is you can either backtrack back, because again, these are smooth, they will slide right back around and end up stacked like this. You can go back to it and fix it. Or, again, cut right here, add a separate thread, and tie onto each side, and adding that card back into it. Do not, you don't have to redo the entire warp because one card is wrong. The rest of your cards are fine, Use them as they are. All right, keeping going around. Make sure you follow the same path. The other thing I have had happen is I'll accidentally go around a wrong peg. And uh-oh, this strand is now way shorter than this strand. What you can do then, again, instead of taking the entire thing off and redoing it, because that, that's a lot of time and work, is to cut the shortest one at the front, take a separate little piece of silk and tie it on, kind of like an extension plug. You'll have, you're going to lose some working area. You'll lose whatever that distance between the first thread, oops, between the first knot and the last knot, you're going to lose that space. But that tends to be a better alternative than actually having to rewarp up the entire project. around and we are still going last card all right back to the top once you drop your last card you are not done don't cut here when you still have a card make sure you go around one more time after that card okay there's our card we're coming around that card also still needs room to weave all right, and now we're back to the front, and we're at the front with zero cards in our hand. That's when we're actually done with these colors. So just like when we went from the red to the blue, stop, snip, set aside your blue and yellow. We're done with them now. Pull back out your red. and drop them back in their buckets. We have two more cards. Looking back at our pattern, that's the opposite side. Two cards, line them up. Take your threads and run it through each hole. So just like before, each card, or each hole, I'm sorry, has one thread running through it. We're not worried about S and Z. We're not worried about anything else. We're just setting up a warp right there. Get them to where they're about even. And then tie simple overhand knot again, just like before. You can trim off your blue and yellow if you need to. Got a knot. We've got it in about the same place, right here on the front end. So we have, oops, let's see, here is our cards now. We have our two red, we have our starting tie right there. Our two reds, the red where it's tied to the blue and yellow, all of the blue and yellow, the end of the blue and yellow tied to the red. Now, we're going to do the same thing. Take these reds, slide them down, drop one card right there at the beginning, take the other card, or rest of cards, depending on how many you have in your pattern, run your warping pattern the exact same way. Get around, drop a card. Go all the way around. Back to the front. No more cards. 
Now we've reached the end of our pattern. This is where it's going to change just a little bit. We're going to trim off. Now we don't want to tie on any more cards. We're done. This is our pattern right here. All of our cards are there. You can straighten them up a little bit so you feel good about them being neat. We're still not worried about S and Z and exactly how the cards are positioned. What we're going to do now is find that very first card again, the one that has the loop around the front peg. So looking at here, I have my end. Now there's two really important things right here. This bottom thread, this end of your warp, has to go under your front peg. Take your first one, the very first thread that you tied on, untie it, got the loose end with the card on it, that has to go over this front peg. If you do this the wrong way, you end up with a little knot right here and nothing moves. Voice of experience. Tie them to each other. That is it. Make a simple knot, tug it a little bit. You want it to be tensioned about the same as the rest of the cards. Um, we have some, I have some tips for troubleshooting tension. We can do that on a different video. Tie it, tug, nice and smooth. I add one more knot because I'm working with silk and it likes to be slippery. Um, weaver's preference there. You, you have to well, find out what works well for you. And you're done. That took us 26 minutes to warp up a 12 card pattern, including talking about what works, what doesn't. That loom is now ready to weave. At this point, you would actually look back through your pattern, figure out which cards are S and which cards are Z. Then after you figure out your S and Z's, you go back in and go, okay, so I need yellow, top front, uh, whichever notation you're used to using at that point, if you're used to A, B, C, D or front back or whichever it is, after you fix your S and Z threaded directions, then you go back and fix where you want the colors and you're ready to go. And you have speed warped and set up an entire loom ready to weave in about 20, 30 minutes. If you have patterns that you can't do all of it speed warp, the more you can speed warp, the faster it's going to be, and the sooner you'll be able to get weaving. This is for an ankle loom. This is this will work for any warp that is a continuous circle. Next week we will do a video that is non-continuous warps. So if you are working warp weighted, if you're working on a belt loom, if you're working on a back strap, if you're doing a peg and board, any of those kind of techniques where the warp goes from one place to another and stops, that's going to be one type of loom. Um, a box loom is the same idea. We will get all of those together next week. So thank you so much. Uh, please feel free to ask me if you have questions. Shoot me a message if there's a video you would like to see. If there's anything I can help with, I am more than happy to do so. Uh, Facebook is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. And I will see you there. Thank you.